Canaan Christian Church, a simple church with a kingdom focus. With our pastor, Dr. Walter Malone Jr., we dare to dream, connecting one with God and one with one another. We teach the Word of God through Connection Group and Wednesday Bible Studies. The Word of God is declared and celebrated each Sunday morning. Through prayer, we build our relationship with God and one another. We proclaim the Word of God locally and globally. The Canaan Christian Church is a great church because we glorify God and seek to spiritually edify the people of God. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the Word of God. Good morning. Good morning to everyone and welcome to our Connection Group Bible Study. I greet you with the joy of the Lord. Let's go before the Lord and we will open up our study. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we bless you. We praise you and we thank you. We give you glory for yet another Lord's Day morning. Now, God, we pray, Lord, that through this word, you will show us ourselves, God. Through your word, you will show us, Lord, where uh, we can be more like the apostles. Help us, God, to walk worthy of the calling that is before us. Help us, God, to find ourselves in a position and in a posture to be witnesses, ambassadors for Christ, even if it means persecution, even if it means being talked about, even if it means loss of things or even our very lives. We give you glory in advance, Lord, for allowing us the opportunity to be your witnesses. And we thank you, God, in the name of Jesus, that you have called us to yourself. And so we thank you. And it is in the mighty name of Jesus that we do pray and we give you the thanks and let every heart say amen. Amen and amen again. Welcome again to our Connection Group Bible Study, whether you have joined us through our YouTube or our Canaan Streaming Broadcast Ministry platforms. We welcome you to today's study and pray that you are blessed. I certainly want to thank my sister uh, Janice Awayo for teaching on last Sunday, and I know that you all were blessed by her teaching. Today we will make our way as we continue through the book of Acts. We will be still in Acts chapter 5 today, but we'll be looking at the latter verses in verses 29 through 42. The title of today's lesson is Worthy worthy acts chapter 5 verses 29 through 42 now the main thought behind our teaching today is that jesus is honored even when his followers are mistreated jesus is honored even when his followers are mistreated that in itself is a word and in uh, our prayer this morning I pray that you felt what the Lord was leading us in um, because we understand that the Christian life in and of itself is filled with what some would call paradoxes, those things that don't necessarily feel like they go together, like the way to be free from sin is to be a slave to Jesus Christ or the way to find true eternal and lasting life is to die to oneself. Amen. There are a lot of things that we have to put away, take off and or get rid of in order to be able to put on the newness of life. Amen. We deny ourselves, but then we gain so much more in the person of Jesus, Jesus Christ and then eternal life itself. And so when we look at today's lesson, just as an introductory, there's a paradox here. There is a paradox here, and it's what's in the main thought, which has to be with, with those that are persecuted for the name of or for following or praising or living in the name of Jesus, witnessing in the name of Jesus, preaching in the name of Jesus. And so what we find, though, 
and I'm not going to go there yet because it's in our text, is that being persecuted in the name of Jesus ought to bring us joy. I know, right? It doesn't feel like it should go together, but thank God we don't live by feelings, or I should say feelings, but we live by feelings. We don't live by our feelings, by our emotions, because if we did, it would make no sense for us to want to move in this posture of being persecuted and then give God the glory for it. No, we live in feelings, F-I-L-L-I-N-G, feelings of the Holy Spirit who then allows us um, by the power of the word of God to understand what Jesus Christ said when meant when he said that he's persecuted. So we should expect to be persecuted as well. And it was Jesus who even then directed the uh, disciples then that if they are persecuted for his name's sake, that they ought to give God some glory. That's an introduction to where we're going because that is exactly what is happening in this text. We ought not shy away from or be surprised by those times where we are persecuted or as our main thought uh, teaches us, are mistreated. But the key to all of that, whether it's persecution, mistreatment, uh, talked about, whatever we are, are experiencing, the way that God receives the glory, the way that Jesus is exalted is because we're mistreated because of him. <laughs> Let me go ahead and get this out the way quick. This lesson is not um, just going through life because life can be tough. And, and we all, the, the sun, the, what is it, the rain, uh, it rains on the just and the unjust, amen, that there is no respecter of person as it relates to life. So we all have to go through things, amen. We all have things that we experience that we might otherwise not choose to go through if we had the choice in doing so. But what we are talking about today are those things that are specifically related to the cause of Christ, amen. Now, if we just move a little bit further, we'll go to our understanding the context. It's not that it's lengthy, but it does cover some of chapter four. If you have any study material with you, it may have the context starting in um, Acts chapter five, verse 17. However, really to bring it all together and connect the, the lesson that we're in today with the lesson that was taught last week, we almost, and I don't have time to do it, but we almost need to go back to Acts chapter 4 and we will reference that throughout our teaching this morning because in Acts chapter 4 we find that the first time that John and Peter um, went before the Sanhedrin council that's the first time that was the first time that Peter stood and basically in his testifying he is preaching and sharing the gospel with those members of the Sanhedrin and so um, from there and then we move to today's lesson, this will then become the second time. But this time, it's not just Peter, it's not just Peter and John, but it's all 12 of the apostles. And even if we just go through our Bible, just to connect the dots from chapter 4 to chapter 5, and then the lesson that was even covered on last Sunday, in chapter 4, we read that Peter and John go before the council. And even in that, the first time they go before the council. Peter makes sure that he says, you know, because the Sanhedrin is ordering them to not speak or to teach in the name of Jesus. And Peter's response basically in verse number 19 is that whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Key, right here, verse number 20, for we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. So, mm, Peter's like, whether it's right or wrong in your sight, we can't stop. That's the first time. And we'll see that again in the verses that we're covering today. And if I can go ahead and fast forward to verse number 32, verse 32 is our memory verse. And it, it has the same or similar verbiage that Peter has spoken back in chapter 4. Really, by the time we, we get to chapter 5 and the verses that we're covering today with Peter and the apostles being before the Sanhedrin yet again, 
he's basically repeating himself. He's not changing his story. He's, he's not coming up with something different to say. It's the same thing, maybe said a little bit of a different way. So by the time we get to verse number 32, we'll bring that out as well. And you can see how that uh, coincides directly with the first time that Peter spoke and testified to the Sanhedrin. Then if we move on through Acts chapter 4, we know before it was all said and done. The man that had been lame for 40 years stood as a, a leaping and praising witness. They couldn't deny that, right? And so they were released. Um, of course, they were told not to speak. They were told not to preach. But of course, they did not abide by that. But after that, the first time being with the council and being before them, they pray for boldness. Y'all remember that, right? So they pray for boldness. From there, we move on a little bit further. The believers are sharing in their possessions. Then last Sunday, um, Sister Janice taught about uh, Brother Ananias and Sister Sapphira. We won't go there. She just taught it. But then we get to verse number 12 of chapter 5. We're moving. We're moving. Verse number 12. And here is where... It, because we see that the opposition and the persecution started somewhat in chapter 4, but we're getting ready to see that it's going to begin to intensify as these chapters move forward. So in Acts chapter 5, verse number 12, the apostles heal many. That's the, that's the titling over this particular section of verses. Verse 12 says, now many signs and wonders were done among the people through the apostles. And that they were also at Solomon's portico and continuing to preach the gospel and there were those that continued to join the church. There were those that came, heard the word, there were those that came with sickness, with ailments, and they were healed of their diseases. You ha we have to understand the context of where we're at right now. Because Jesus had already told them, you're going to receive power once the Holy Spirit comes. Amen. He promised that. And they are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and the boldness to which the Holy Spirit has now given to them. They are committed to the sharing of the gospel. So then by the time we get to verse 17 of chapter 5, here is where we begin to see that persecution is coming in to play. Verse number 17 says, then the high priest took action. The high priest, Anas, he was beside himself. Let's be beside himself and the Sadducees and the Pharisees were be besides themselves as well. And listen to verse number 17. And I'm going through these verses because we are setting the stage for where we are going throughout our focal text. Verse 17 says, then the high priest took action. He and all who were with him, that is the sect of the Sadducees, listen, being filled with jealousy. That's the motivation, jealousy and hatred. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. Now, I don't even have time to tell you this first, this first part, this, this middle part of chapter 5. Let me just go ahead and tell you really quick. So they put the, the apostles in jail. And, and, and somewhere in the nighttime, there was an angel of the Lord that came to the prison and opened the prison doors and brought them out. Now listen, verse number, we got to get to our text. Verse number 20. We got to make sure we're, we're, we're putting all the pieces together. Chapter 4, verse number um, 20. We cannot keep silent about the things that we have seen and about the things that we have heard. Then they have this angel that comes to the jail. They're arrested. They're being persecuted. They're put in this jail. An angel comes in, brings them out. And then the angel says, go stand in the temple and tell the people the whole message about this life. Now, I don't have time. That verse right there is a verse. Oh my God, that speaks volumes. But the angel is giving them instruction. The angel has told them and commanded them to do what he just said to do. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak. They didn't, they didn't wait. They went right in at daybreak, which was probably one of the most busiest times of the morning, that there would be those persons that would be coming to give their sacrifices. So basically, the church was packed. And they went in and they were obedient. Somebody say obedient. Come on, obedient. Write it down. Obedient. P put the dots together. The Holy Spirit is speaking. An angel is sent. And they 
um, abide by what the angel has told them. They walk out what the angel has instructed. They walk through the doors of opportunity that avail themselves, allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to lead them and what they say and share with the high priest and the Sanhedrin. Let's keep moving because we need to get to our focal text. If we can, we'll go back a little bit further. But this is the setup. This is where we are now. They've been let out of jail. And now the uh, chief jailer is tasked with having to tell the high priest that they don't know where these brothers are, that, 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 that they're gone. And so they go out and they find them with the temple police and they locate them. They didn't have to look far. They, they knew where they went. They, there's this contention, but the contention comes from the place of them preaching and teaching in the temple. So they send the temple police out. And then if we just go ahead and read verse 27 and 28, that'll lead us into our focal text. Um, because if there was any fear, fear, I use the word fear, if there was any fear among anybody, it wasn't with the apostles. Uh, we know that the Sanhedrin uh, and, and the high priest were not necessarily fearful, but they were filled with jealousy. They were filled with hatred. They were filled with anger. And verse 27 says, when they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. So they went to get them from the temple. The high priest questioned them saying, listen, verse 28 is setting it up. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. Our focal text is verse number 29. Our beginning of our focal text is starting in verse number 29, but verse number 28, we can't go by that because the high priest is questioning them, but as he questions them about Jesus, he never uses, his, uses Jesus's name. A lot of S's in there. He never, he never uses the name of Jesus. He refers to him as to teach in this name and then to bring this man's blood on us. So basically what Peter said to him the last time, <laughs> that, that you are responsible. And, and we already taught that, that they, that they were, the, the Jewish people were in some way responsible as well for Jesus's death. And so he's saying, Basically, you're going to come back again, even though we told you what not to do, strict orders. And so here you are yet again. And then here, listen, and we're moving on. And you have filled Jerusalem. Now, let's be clear as we move on. Let's, 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 let's get ready to move on. It wasn't just Peter. It wasn't just John. It wasn't just the 12 apostles. It is the church. The, the church that is being birthed, then the church that is continually being taught and edified and encouraged. It is the church that is continuing to hold on to those teachings and go out into Jerusalem and share the gospel. And they are already in the process, the beginning of the process of turning the world upside down. The, the church, come on somebody, has influence. Look at the text. The, 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 the high priest says, and have filled Jerusalem. You have filled the city of Jerusalem with your teaching. And, and literally, you are determined to continue to blame us for his death. So the church has influence. The church continues to grow. And now the, the, the most influential religious and political leaders of the day are filled with jealousy and hatred. That's where we are by the time we get to verse number 29. Walk with me. First section is entitled Angry Response. Angry Response. It's going to cover verses 29 through 33. The main idea of this section is that believers can expect some to reject the truth of Jesus. Now, I can't expound on that. It speaks for itself. But if we're sharing, if we're attempting to share Jesus Christ with others that do not know him, could be even, let me qualify that. Let me just be clear. It could be those that believe that they do know him. That's a different conversation because we, I'm not sure sometimes that the Jesus people think they believe in. Is it the Jesus that 
they made up or is it the Jesus in the Bible? Because the Jesus in the Bible and sometimes the Jesus that we are holding on to ain't the same Jesus. Let's keep going. So this section is that believers can expect, we can expect, we can expect if we're sharing, if we are ambassadors, if we are teaching, if we are attempting to share the love of Jesus with others, we can expect that there are gonna be those persons that are gonna come against us. Some, we, we expect that some people are going to reject us, but it's really not us, it's the truth of Jesus. And that's where the line we need to be clear about. We, we need to not take it personally, because it's not us. It's actually the truth of Jesus. And we already talked about it at the very beginning. If they rejected him, if they persecuted him, we should expect the same. Let's read these verses. Verse 29, Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than people. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Verse 32 is our memory verse. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So very quickly, verse number 32 is the beginning of uh, Peter's closing statement. I should say Peter and the apostles' closing statement. They're closing around verse number 32, but that's the verse that coincides with verse, uh, chapter 4, verse number 20 um, that I read earlier. We are witnesses of these things. Where they're basically saying, we've seen, look, we know too much. <laughs> we've seen too much. We've experienced too much, I've heard too much word, I've received too much word, I've seen too many miracles, I've seen too many signs, I've seen how God has worked not only in my life, but in the life of my family and life of people that I really don't even know, but I got the word of the miracle. That's what they're saying, and that's what we need to be able to say, because we are witnesses. We are witnesses of the saving and transforming work that Jesus has performed in our own lives, which is why we can often say, if you want to see a miracle, look at me. <laughs> if you want to see what God can do, look at me. If, if you knew me back then and now you see me today, you can understand that it had to be a God somewhere that did what he did in my life so that I could be the woman or the man that I am today. Amen? So when we look at verse number 29, we see um, Peter and the apostles reply, their response to what the, the high priest has now posed to them, having uh, basically come against them because they didn't follow his strict orders to not speak in that name, to teach in that name, and that they still blaming us as the Jews and the, the, the high priests and the religious uh, leaders for the death of Jesus. And Peter's response is very similar to that in Acts chapter four, verse number 19. But this is more succinct. And this is a statement that we could live by very easily. You gotta make a choice on some things. But Peter says, we must obey God rather than people. Now, I, I know that I'm short on time already because this is just a wonderful lesson filled with a lot of uh, truth and a lot of pearls, of nug pearls and nug nuggets of wisdom, but we cannot go by this verse too quickly because verse number 29 puts everything in perspective. They're on trial again. And what did I say earlier? Ain't nobody mad but them. And ain't nobody scared, but beforehand, the temple police. There's no fear in Peter and in the apostles. But what basically Peter is saying, we understand that there are laws in the land. And we understand that there are some things that on a human perspective that should not be done. But this right here, when it comes to obeying what God has told us to do, Anytime God's commands versus the commands or the laws of the land come into uh, 
um, competition or come in uh, against one another. The laws of God will always supersede the law or human law of man. Let me give you a quick example and then we'll keep it moving. Married couple, due in taxes. The wife is submitted to her husband. Husband says, I'm gonna take care of the taxes. And now listen, we could switch it because I'm the one that does the taxes in my own home. So either way, taxes are being done, but both parties got to sign off on them. And as the wife looks at them, or if in my case, if my husband looks at them, which half the time he doesn't, but if he's looking through them and he starts looking at the income that I put, or he starts looking at some of the expenses that I have listed, and he's like, wait a minute, this don't add up. Yeah, I know, but it's going to give us a better refund. The laws of God supersede the fact that I'm supposed to be submissive to my husband in that moment because he's, he is now lying in the process of filling out the tax return. Does that, now, that's a simple example, and we can elevate that, but that's trying to just keep it real easy because sometimes we overcomplicate things and then we want to have long dissertations about what is right and what is wrong. Either it is right or it ain't. And so the law of God is going to always supersede the laws of man. And Peter said, we got to obey God. And that's at the end of the day, that's what we have to do. We got to obey God. And so when he, the angel came and gave them direction, they, to go back to the same place they just arrested you in the first time and then go back when it's going to be the most crowded. They weren't thinking about themselves, what's going to happen, we're going to get arrested, we're going to get beat up, whatever the case may be. But we, we got to follow what God says. Verse number 30, the God of our ancestors. So this is where Peter then begins, Peter and the apostles begin to preach yet again. Now what's interesting, let's read verse 30. What's interesting if we didn't see it the first time, if the Sanhedrin didn't acknowledge it the first time, they're getting another opportunity for themselves, literally, to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostles say, the God of our ancestors raised up Jesus. Okay? Who is that? It's the prophets that foretold that the Messiah was coming in the first place. It's the prophets who you um, adore, who you um, look to, especially that person, uh, Moses. We know that they love them, so Moses and the law. But you got the word. You received the word that the Messiah was coming, yet you determined that you would reject the word. And then they're indicted again, whom you had murdered. Listen, by hanging him on a tree. And if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 21, around verses 22 through 23, it speaks about and it talks about um, that you, a person that has committed a sin that is worthy of death, and that he would be put to death and would be hung on a tree. The re reality is that Jesus Christ hung, bled, and died a death that was our death. And that's what Peter and the apostles are trying to get them to understand. The one that you crucified, the one that you murdered, he's the one that died in your place. It should have been you. It should have been me hanging on a tree. And so they're missing it because they're so filled with jealousy. They're, they're missing the fact that the, the prophets of old had, had already prophesied that there would be one in the person of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would come and who would not destroy the law, but fulfill the law. Um, the apostles say in verse number 31, God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior. Here again, when we read about being exalted, we know that the uh, Sadducees didn't uh, believe in the resurrection or a resurrection, whereas the Pharisees actually did believe in a resurrection. But Peter and the apostles are pointing yet again to the fact that Jesus is not dead. He is the Messiah and is yet alive, and he is sitting on the right hand of the Father. And then that latter part, the gospel, as ruler and savior. They say to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. That part right there is what they should have received. That part right there was the gospel of salvation. The fact that Jesus died so that we could receive a repentance 
and then also forgiveness of sins. And basically, and really, repentance and, and uh, forgiveness go hand in hand. It's almost like two different sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. We got to repent of those sins, right? And then we are what? Forgiven of those sins. Verse 32, then again, I've already taught it, we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit. Listen, we're witnesses, but be clear, the Holy Spirit, that's what they're teaching. The Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him, is also a witness of everything that has taken place, even right now. When we come to Jesus in repentance, and when we come to Jesus in faith, we're forgiven. When we're forgiven, when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, and the Holy Spirit will help us to remember and to recall those things for which he has taught us and for which he has done. They're witnesses, and they're standing on what they've already seen, heard, and experienced. The question is, what have we seen? What have we heard? What have we experienced? And are we standing on that proof, that proof that no one else can take away from us because it is what we have experienced through the transformative work and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives? The last line in this section, verse number 33, this last verse sums it up. It's a reminder to what we read earlier in verse number 17 of this same chapter. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. That's where they were. They wanted to kill them. And then when we turn the page and we get to the next section, um, when we talk about Brother Gamaliel, we'll understand why. Because when we look at the word um, Enraged. This is the Christian Standard Bible. In the King James Version, instead of the word enraged, there is a word that is used that means, and I think it actually reads, they were cut to the quick. They were cut to, the, they were literally being torn in two because of the rage that they felt against the apostles, so much so that they wanted to kill them. Chapter 4, put it all together, right? We know that the intensity of persecution is now beginning to take place and shape. In verse 4, they were let off with a warning. Don't do it no more. Don't teach in Jesus' name anymore. But of course, they prayed for boldness and went out and did it more and all the more. And so now things are starting to change quite rapidly. And so now as we get to chapter 5 and where we are now in their second um, trial, if you will, before the Sanhedrin Council, they haven't let up. They haven't stopped believing. They haven't become afraid to the point of stopping. And I, I, I have to believe that it, somewhere in there, they may have thought about it, but the Holy Spirit in them pushed them on to continue to be bold, continue to speak what they knew to be the truth because they were what? Witnesses. They'd seen too much and they had heard too much. So even though this section talks about an angry response, the angry response of the Sanhedrin, even though this is inferring that there are some that may reject the truth of who Jesus is, we still got to stand on what we know. We got to still stand and teach and preach. And that's the prayer. The prayer is that we can get there as a body of believers, that we can get there. And, 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 and if we're honest, we have to be honest. We, we got to be honest. There's sometimes even in the sanctuary, we don't even want to turn to other believers. Pastor says, turn to, you, you know, turn to the person to your left and to the right and tell them whatever. We, don't, we halfway want to do that. So if we halfway want to turn to people that we should already have a relationship with, that we, and if there's nothing else because we are brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe you don't, you don't go to their house to eat and you're not all related by family. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the blood of Jesus that binds us together, right? The koinia, the community that binds us together, the fellowship that binds us together. And we don't even sometimes want to turn to that person and, and, and give them a, an encouraging word. So we got to be prayerful. We got to be prayerful. Let's move to the next section, wise counsel. 
Oh my, let me keep moving. Wise counsel, verses 34 through 39. Now the main idea of this section is that believers can stand with confidence knowing the gospel has passed the test of time. I like that. I don't know about you, but I like that. That believers can stand with confidence knowing that the gospel has passed the test of time. So let's look at this. Um, let's read. Let's go ahead and read. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. He said to them, men of Israel, be careful about what you're about to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody and a group of about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and all the followers were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. He also perished and all his followers were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. They were persuaded by him. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to share just a little bit of information with the time that I have left. We want to share a little bit of information about who Gamaliel was. I can't give a, a huge overview, but I want to share a little bit of information about that because it's quite interesting, different um, Theologians and commentators have uh, different thoughts about his motive for why he said what he said and did what he did as it relates to um, advising the council to let the apostles go. But if we look at him, let me just tell you a little bit about him, and then we'll go back to the text and we'll look at the fact that he was a Pharisee because he's one of them. We know that the Sanhedrin council is made up of both, uh, was made up of both uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. He was a Pharisee. Now, a couple of things. His name means God is my rewarder. Isn't that interesting? Um, let's see here. Also, he was, of course, one, one of the seven highly respected rabbi who was also the, given the title of Rabban. So that's a different titling. He was a highly respected rabbi. He was known for caring for and staying in control with the scattered Jews of the diaspora. Then we also know him as, he was the um, mentor of our brother Paul, as we go a little bit further down, Acts chapter 22. He's, Paul studied under Gamaliel. Um, yes, the last part that I'll share with you is that as we go into this section, wise counsel, is that Gamaliel, he has a position. He's taking a position as to why the council needs to keep their hands off of the apostles and just let stuff go. Let it fizzle out if it's going to fizzle, but if it doesn't fizzle out, to um, not put themselves in the position of fighting against God. So there's a couple of things here. Some say that Gamaliel, he, now we know he's not, he's not a believer. He's not saved at this point. Um, it could be because there is always this contention between the Pharisees and the Sadducees that as he's giving this advice, that maybe he's trying to what? One up the, Pharise the uh, Sadducees since he was a Pharisee. But let's look at something else because a Pharisee and the Pharisees were teachers of the law. We question oftentimes, <laughs> what were they teaching? What were they studying? Because they totally missed Jesus, right? But they were, they were the religious teachers uh, of that day. And so in as much that when we look at and we you know, think about the Pharisees, we think of them in somewhat of a, what, a negative light. And certainly we know that they, um, along with the Sadducees, participated in the ultimate um, death of Jesus. He laid his life down, I understand, but we understand that they participated in that. But, the other piece, though, is that 
there were some Pharisees that didn't necessarily oppose Jesus, that didn't necessarily or at least openly oppose his claim of being Messiah. And then also that we want to keep in kind of the back of our mind is that, and I mentioned it earlier, the Sadducees didn't believe in um, resurrection, but the Pharisees did. And they also had a belief that God was active in daily life. Um, you can also reference Acts 23 and 8 for what I kind of just spoke. Why is that important? Well, first of all, Gamaliel was already respected. He was respected as a Pharisee. They weren't all totally godless individuals. So that's the point we're trying to make here. They weren't, some of them were, uh, you know, went astray, certainly, right? But, but I say that because in him taking a position, if he is taking a position of anything, he is taking a position as a Pharisee. But in the examples that he gives related to uh, Theodos and Judas the Galilean, if you are a religious teacher of the law, a keeper of the law, certainly God ought to be in your purview somewhere. And so this is not definitive, but let's look at the text when he reminds them and says, hey, we got to be careful about these, these men. Um, like, pump the brakes a little bit. Let's not forget it ain't been that long uh, that the brother that was at the, um, the pool of Bethesda was uh, jumping, uh, the, the pool, the, the gate called Beautiful, was jumping up and down. And we know that brother been lame forever. So let's just slow down just a little bit. They, they've been healing people and there's a whole lot going on and this movement is not slowing down right now. But instead of us coming against them, we should just let them go and leave them alone. And he gives two examples of other men who had created a following, but then things that you know came up and happened, the following fizzled out after the death of the individual Fetus, he was killed, and then the movement, it failed and came to nothing. Judas, the Galilean, he attracted a following, but once he died, they were all scattered. We know that as time goes on, that each of the apostles is going to die. But come on in here, somebody. We also know that Jesus died but rose again. The apostles died martyrs' deaths. Come on, somebody. But yet the gospel is still going forth. So is, if it's of man, it's going to fizzle. If it is of God, can't nobody stop it. That's all we're trying to say right there. If it's of men, mm, it could possibly fizzle out. But if it's of God... Can't nobody stop it. I need somebody to get that in their spirit because the things that are going on in our own lives We're allowing them to overtake us, but it's human stuff and we're, 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 we're leaving out the God factor But if God is sovereign if God is in control if God is always handling all the details of my life Why am I allowing those things to then make me uh, forget who I am? It's of God if God said it then it's going to happen. That settles it. And, and if God is for me, who can be what? Against me. Ha! <sighs> he tells the men of Galilee, men of Israel, be careful. Pay close attention. Consider carefully what it is that you are about to do. And leave them alone. Verse number 39 says, it could be of human origin, but if not, and it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Amen. And that you might even be found fighting against God. That's not the place that you want to find yourself. You do not want to find yourself fighting with God. You don't want to find yourself in opposition to God. You don't want to find yourselves in the hands of a frustrated God. Mm, let God be God and his enemies be scattered. Let's move on to the last section. I think I've got just enough time to move on to the last section because, you know, when we look at this, um, when we, there's a couple of, 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 of verses in here that really kind of kind of pull at us. One is we must obey God rather than people, that one. And then also you may even be found fighting against God. Any true believer, any true believer, 
any true believer should not want to be standing in the way of what God is doing, whatever that might be. <laughs> we don't want to stand in the way of what God is doing. And we have to understand our place and understand that God is ultimately the one in control. And we, we, we pray and we believe, but at the end of the day, what God says in his will is what is going to stand. What his will is, is what's always going to be best for our lives. And when we talk about being obedient, when we talk about being obedient to God versus um, versus uh, against human um, origin, like God, human origin. Well, we can narrow it down even further. So right before we go to our last section, I, I had a quote from John Piper, and I didn't share it earlier, but let me just read this to you because this puts this in perspective. And it really makes us need to stop and think for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So John Piper says, the most important thing that this text does, and specifically related to uh, Peter and the apostles saying they have to obey God, is to put all of our social and political life into relation to God. Listen, the Bible is not a book about how to get along in the world. It is a book inspired by God about how to live to God. He says, I love the phrase, live to God. It's not mine. It's Paul's. John Piper reminds us that Paul says, what Paul has said in Galatians 2.19, which he says, through the law I died to the law that I might live to God. That's who we're living to, but unfortunately, in these days, a lot of folks, saved or not saved, are living unto themselves. <laughs> we're living to our own thoughts, we're living to our own desires, we're living to our own authority, we're living to our own perceived power, we're living to our own agendas. But the reality is that we need to be living to God and not to ourselves. We need to be living as if we are literal slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to the last section with the last few minutes that I have, covering verses 40 through 42. The title of this section is Grateful Suffering. Grateful Suffering. The main idea here is that believers can rejoice with every opportunity to honor Jesus. This is where we can shout. And I know when you read it, you may say, shout, yes. When we find ourselves in the position and in the posture of the apostles in these verses, and that we are found worthy, what's the title of today's lesson? When we are found worthy to be persecuted because we're walking out, being obedient to what God has called us to do, even though it could cause us some harm, even though we could lose some stuff and things, even maybe our own lives. This is where the rubber meets the road. And this is where we have to have a pray and ask God to help us to walk out fully and authentically the call that is on our lives. Verses 40 through 42, after they called in the apostles and they had flogged them, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and released them. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. <laughs> Every day in the temple and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Woo, Lord. Okay, let me, let's, let's go. After they called in the apostles, so Gamaliel said, y'all step out. We need to talk. He renders this advice. And after they called them back in, they call them back in and then they flog them. Now, a, to be flogged means to either be uh, beaten with a rod or a whip. And now, actually, the word flog comes from the word flayed. And to be flayed literally means to remove the skin. So we know that when Jesus, so there's a very close parallel that when Jesus was crucified and going through the crucifixion process, that he was scourged, S-C-O-U-R-G-E-D, scourged. But that's because the Romans, they added some extra to the flogging where they added the cattle nine tails onto the onto the ends of whatever the rod or the whip that they were beating persons with and so that when they did so and then they pulled back that then would take off some skin or a lot of skin actually and in this particular instance the word flogged here is very very similar now 
it is possible, depending on the person, that they could have died from a flogging. Um, in this particular case, it would have been very painful. Let's be clear about that, very painful, because that word flayed, again, still means to remove skin. They would um, give them no more than 40, no more than 40 strikes, no more than 40 lashes. We've heard that 40 uh, minus one. So typically it was around 40 because after that and up until that point, it would be, it be considered extremely humiliating and then nine times out of 10 people then would um, suffer, ex suffer expo exponentially and then die oftentimes because of the number of lashes within the beating. And the, that limitation goes all the way back to the Old Testament to those 40 lashes. They call them in, they flog them, and then yet again, so they, they will call them in, they beat them down, and then they tell them again to not speak in the name of Jesus, and then they release them. They call them in, they beat them, and then say, now don't go out there speaking and preaching in the name of Jesus, and then they what? Release them. Now, we've done this before. They didn't get flogged necessarily the first time. They got, got off with a, a warning. But here, they, they've been beaten, and then they're released. And in verse number 41, then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin. They got outside the door. <laughs> they got just far enough away, outside, away from the Sanhedrin, no longer in their what? In their presence. And as soon as they did, they began rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy mm -hmm, to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. When was the last time <laughs> that you were mistreated for the name? When was the last time that you got beat down uh, for declaring the name, teaching the name? We come in here, we receive a, a mighty word every Sunday, every Wednesday. Ain't nobody getting beat down for that. Amen. But yet they did. But they left rejoicing. They had joy. But why did they have joy? They had joy because of the title of the lesson, which means that they were worthy, counted worthy. We were beaten because of the name of Jesus, which means we were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. Oftentimes, we're so busy trying to uh, protect our rights. I, I'm going to qualify all that in just a minute, but understand what I'm saying. This is not every, this is not just anything. This is Jesus. This is the name of Jesus. And so sometimes our lines get blurred about what we will do and what we're not going to do. And they, such and such would never do that to me. And then before we know it, we, we speak in all kinds of ways, don't sound nothing like a Christian. We clapping back and doing all the other things that they, that they uh, call out, right? And especially in social media. A and we lose some of that witness. But when it's Jesus, <laughs> when it's Jesus, and when we suffer or are mistreated or are persecuted because of Jesus, we ought to walk in humility and submission anyway. Mm, let me help somebody. Humility and submission as the people of God. But when we are suffering for the name of Jesus, there ought to be a joy in our heart. And the reason why they were joyful was because they were considered to be worthy to suffer the way that he suffered. In reality, what it was is they felt honored to be dishonored. Yeah, we, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna leave that alone. They felt honored to be dishonored. Halle. Now, I'm not talking about, let me make sure I'm clear. I'm talking about to be dishonored for the name of Jesus. I'm not talking about, one, things that we created. <laughs> we made decisions and there were consequences. I'm not talking about that. I I'm not talking about being in situations or relationships that are unhealthy, dysfunctional, whereas other people are putting their hands on you. I'm not talking about that. May hear me clearly. I'm not talking about that. What I am talking about is when we make a choice to stand up for what is right. When we make a choice to speak on something that we know to be true in the face of opposition that otherwise would say, shut up, sit down, don't say nothing else, be quiet. But we say, because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, I gotta speak on him. I can't let that go, because I know the truth, amen? 
And then the last part in verse number 42, every day in the temple, this is what we got to get, every day in the temple, and then in various homes, they continue. Now that continual, um, it, it speaks of a continual or a habitual practice. It, it, it was their lifestyle. It was every day. It was uh, day after day that they continued doing what they were called to do, which was what? Proclaim the good news. Somebody got to get it. There's good news. And, and we've been saved for so long that I think sometimes we forget there's good news. Uh, what does pastor say now? Jesus is in this house. We need to share the good news with people. What's the good news? Well, the Bible tells us here in verse number 42 that the good news is that Jesus is the Messiah. They went to the temple. They went to church. Then they went to one another's homes. And as they went to one another's homes, they continued to teach and educate and empower people by the power of the word of God so that they understood what it was they actually believed. So they understood what it was they were standing on as far as the foundation of what it was that they were being taught. They, they taught them so that they would know when they come against somebody, oh, I'm not coming against you, but I'm coming against the enemy that's in you. But I'm going to speak a word over your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to believe that it's done. I'm going to believe that you're going to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. They proclaimed the good news. The good news is that Jesus is the Messiah. It's the good news. It's the good news that the Sanhedrin wanted to keep at bay. It's the good news that the Sanhedrin were upset that Jerusalem was hearing the good news. Now maybe everybody didn't receive it, but everybody was what? Hearing the good news. Every day they had zeal. Every day they had passion. Every day they had perseverance. And they had to every day because the threat on their lives was real every day. But they went about their father's business. And the question is, as we close, have we gotten away from the good news? We talk about a lot of different things when we meet people, but are we talking about Jesus? Yes, we want to invite them to our church, but we need to talk to them about Jesus who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, how Jesus has changed our lives, that without him, I am not Jesus, the one who hung, bled, and died, Jesus, the one who rose again, Jesus, with the power of the Holy Spirit, who's already taught the apostles, and now they're just teaching what they had already been taught. They're witnesses. They received the good news, and now they are sharing the good news. And so at the end of the day, the apostles are redeeming the time, Yes, they're redeeming the time because they understand the earth is finite and heaven is eternal. And so they understand that they're not living forever. They understand they got to talk while they got a, a mind to talk. They got to share while they are able to share. They got to do what they can do while they can do it before they cannot because they understand that tomorrow is not promised. So I got today. I got today. And while I got today, I'm going to share the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. I am excited about this study, if you can't tell, in Acts. And I'm just praying and believing that we as the people of God are going to take this word, eat it, hide it in our hearts, and walk it out and be those bold witnesses testifying to the goodness of Jesus, testifying to the good news that Jesus is Messiah. Messiah, he is the one, the anointed one that shall return. Jesus is who we should be what? focusing on. Listen, next Sunday is serving. Serving is the title of the lesson. We'll be in Acts chapter 6 verses 1 through 15. Lord knows that's my time. So I'm going to stop right there before I say another word. But don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. Our pastor will be with us in just a moment with another powerful word from the Lord. Be blessed. <laughs> 